Section One of Cousin Phyllis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Cousin Phyllis by Elizabeth Gaskell. Part One. Section One. It is a great thing for a lad when he is first turned into the independence of lodgings. I do not think I was ever so satisfied and proud in my life as when, at seventeen, I sat down in a little three-cornered room above a pastry-cook's shop in the county town of Eltham. My father had left me that afternoon, after delivering himself of a few plain precepts, strongly expressed, for my guidance in the new course of life on which I was entering. I was to be a clerk under the engineer who had undertaken to make the little branch line from Eltham to Hornby. My father had got me this situation, which was in a position rather above his own in life, or perhaps, I should say, above the station in which he was born and bred, for he was raising himself every year in men's consideration and respect. He was a mechanic by trade, but he had some inventive genius, and a great deal of perseverance and had devised several valuable improvements in railway machinery. He did not do this for profit, though, as was reasonable. What came in the natural course of things was acceptable. He worked out his ideas, because, as he said, until he could put them into shape, they plagued him by night and by day. But this is enough about my dear father. It is a good thing for a country when there are many like him. He was a sturdy independent by dissent and conviction, and this it was, I believe, which made him place me in the lodgings at the pastry-cook's. The shop was kept by the two sisters of our minister at home, and this was considered as a sort of safeguard to my morals when I was turned loose upon the temptations of the county town with a salary of thirty pounds a year. My father had given up two precious days, and put on his Sunday clothes, in order to bring me to Eltham, and accompany me first to the office, to introduce me to my new master, who was under some obligations to my father for a suggestion, and next to take me to call on the independent minister of the little congregation at Eltham. And then he left me, and though sorry to part with him, I now began to taste with relish the pleasure of being my own master. I unpacked the hamper that my mother had provided me with, and smelt the pots of preserve with all the delight of a possessor who might break into their contents at any time he pleased. I handled and weighed in my fancy the home-cured ham, which seemed to promise me interminable feasts, and above all, there was the fine savour of knowing that I might eat of these dainties when I liked, at my sole will not dependent on the pleasure of any one else, however indulgent. I stowed my eatables away in the little corner cupboard. That room was all corners, and everything was placed in a corner—the fireplace, the window, the cupboard. I myself seemed to be the only thing in the middle, and there was hardly room for me. The table was made of a folding leaf under the window, and the window looked out upon the market-place. So the studies for the prosecution of which my father had brought himself to pay extra for a sitting-room for me, ran a considerable chance of being diverted from books to men and women. I was to have my meals with the two elderly Miss Dawsons in the little parlour behind the three-cornered shop downstairs. My breakfasts and dinners at least, for as my hours in an evening were likely to be uncertain, my tea or supper was to be an independent meal. Then, after this pride and satisfaction, came a sense of desolation. I had never been from home before, and I was an only child, and though my father's spoken maxim had been, spare the rod and spoil the child, yet unconsciously his heart had yearned after me, and his ways towards me were more tender than he knew, or would have approved of in himself could he have known. My mother, who never professed sternness, was far more severe than my father. Perhaps my boyish faults annoyed her more, for I remember, now that I have written the above words, how she pleaded for me once in my riper years, when I had really offended against my father's sense of right. But I have nothing to do with that now. 
It is about cousin Phyllis that I am going to write, and as yet I am far enough from even saying who cousin Phyllis was. For some months after I was settled in Eltham, the new employment in which I was engaged, the new independence of my life, occupied all my thoughts. I was at my desk by eight o'clock, home to dinner at one, back at the office by two. The afternoon work was more uncertain than the mornings. It might be the same, or it might be that I had to accompany Mr. Holdsworth, the managing engineer, to some point on the line between Eltham and Hornby. This I always enjoyed, because of the variety, and because of the country we traversed, which was very wild and pretty, and because I was thrown into companionship with Mr. Holdsworth, who held the position of hero in my boyish mind. He was a young man of five and twenty or so, and was in a station above mine, both by birth and education, and he had travelled on the continent, and wore mustachios and whiskers of a somewhat foreign fashion. I was proud of being seen with him. He was really a fine fellow in a good number of ways, and I might have fallen into much worse hands. Every Saturday I wrote home, telling of my weekly doings. My father had insisted upon this, but there was so little variety in my life that I often found it hard work to fill a letter. On Sundays I went twice to chapel, up a dark, narrow entry, to hear droning hymns and long prayers, and a still longer sermon, preached to a small congregation, of which I was, by nearly a score of years, the youngest member. Occasionally Mr. Peters, the minister, would ask me home to tea after the second service. I dreaded the honour, for I usually sat on the edge of my chair all the evening, and answered solemn questions, put in a deep bass voice, until household prayer-time came, at eight o'clock, when Mrs. Peters came in, smoothing down her apron, and the maid of all work followed, and first a sermon and then a chapter was read, and long impromptu prayer followed till some instinct told Mr. Peters that supper-time had come, and we rose from our knees with hunger for our predominant feeling. Over supper the minister did unbend a little into one or two ponderous jokes, as if to show me that ministers were men after all. And then at ten o'clock I went home, and enjoyed my long-repressed yawns in the three-cornered room before going to bed. Dinah and Hannah Dawson, so their names were put on the board above the shop-door, I always called them Miss Dawson and Miss Hannah, considered these visits of mine to Mr. Peters as the greatest honour a young man could have, and evidently thought that if after such privileges I did not work out my salvation, I was a sort of modern Judas Iscariot. On the contrary, they shook their heads over my intercourse with Mr. Holdsworth. He had been so kind to me in many ways, that when I cut into my ham, I hovered over the thought of asking him to tea in my room, more especially as the annual fair was being held in Eltham Market-place, and the sight of the booths, the merry-go-rounds, the wild beast-shows, and such country pomps, was, as I thought at seventeen, very attractive. But when I ventured to allude to my wish in even distant terms, Miss Hannah caught me up, and spoke of the sinfulness of such sights, and something about wallowing in the mire and then vaulted into France, and spoke evil of the nation, and all who had ever set foot therein, till seeing that her anger was concentrating itself into a point, and that that point was Mr. Holdsworth, I thought it would be better to finish my breakfast, and make what haste I could out of the sound of her voice. I rather wondered afterwards to hear her and Miss Dawson counting up their weekly profits with glee, and saying that a pastry-cook's shop in the corner of the market-place in Eltham Fair Week was no such bad thing. However, I never ventured to ask Mr. Holdsworth to my lodgings. There is not much to tell about this first year of mine at Eltham, but when I was nearly nineteen, and beginning to think of whiskers on my own account, I came to know cousin Phyllis, whose very existence had been unknown to me till then. Mr. Holdsworth and I had been out to Heathbridge for a day, working hard. Heathbridge was near Hornby, for our line of railway was above half finished. Of course a day's outing was a great thing to tell about in my weekly letters, and I fell to describing the country, a fault I was not often guilty of. I told my father of the bogs, all over wild myrtle and soft moss, 
and shaking ground over which we had to carry our line, and how Mr. Holdsworth and I had gone for our midday meals, for we had to stay here for two days and a night, to a pretty village hard by, Heathbridge proper, and how I hoped we should have often to go there, for the shaking uncertain ground was puzzling our engineers, one end of the line going up as soon as the other was weighted down. I had no thought for the shareholders' interests, as may be seen. We had to make a new line on firmer ground before the railway junction was completed. I told all this at a great length, thankful to fill up my paper. By return letter I heard that a second cousin of my mother's was married to the independent minister of Hornby, Ebenezer Holman by name, and lived at Heathbridge proper, the very Heathbridge I had described, or so my mother believed, for she had never seen her cousin Phyllis Green, who was something of an heiress, my father believed, being her father's only child, and old Thomas Green had owned an estate of near upon fifty acres, which must have come to his daughter. My mother's feeling of kinship seemed to have been strongly stirred by the mention of Heathbridge, for my father said she desired me, if ever I went thither again, to make inquiry for the Reverend Ebenezer Holman, and if indeed he lived there, I was further to ask if he had not married one Phyllis Green, and if both these questions were answered in the affirmative, I was to go and introduce myself as the only child of Margaret Manning, born Moneypenny. I was enraged at myself for having named Heathbridge at all, when I found what it was drawing down upon me. One independent minister, as I said to myself, was enough for any man, and here I knew, that is to say I had been catechised on Sabbath mornings, by Mr. Dawson, our minister at home, and had just to be civil to old Peters at Eltham, and behave myself for five hours running whenever he asked me to tea at his house. And now, just as I felt the free air blowing about me up at Heathbridge, I was to ferret out another minister, and I should perhaps have to be catechised by him, or else asked to tea at his house. Besides, I did not like pushing myself upon strangers, who perhaps had never heard of my mother's name, and such an odd name as it was, Moneypenny. And if they had, had never cared more for her than she had for them, apparently, until this unlucky mention of Heathbridge. Still, I would not disobey my parents in such a trifle, however irksome it might be. So the next time our business took me to Heathbridge, and we were dining in the little sanded-in parlour, I took the opportunity of Mr. Holdsworth's being out of the room, and asked the questions which I was bidden to ask of the rosy-cheeked maid. I was either unintelligible, or she was stupid, for she said she did not know, but would ask master. And, of course, the landlord came in to understand what it was I wanted to know, and I had to bring out all my stammering inquiries before Mr. Holdsworth, who would never have attended to them, I dare say, if I had not blushed and blundered, and made such a fool of myself. Yes, the landlord said, the Hope Farm was in Heathbridge proper, and the owner's name was Holman, and he was an independent minister, and as far as the landlord could tell, his wife's Christian name was Phyllis. Anyhow, her maiden name was Green. "'Relations of yours?' asked Mr. Holdsworth. "'No, sir, only my mother's second cousins. Yes, I suppose they are relations, but I never saw them in my life.' "'The Hope Farm is not a stone's throw from here,' said the officious landlord, going to the window. "'If you carry your eye over yon bed of hollyhocks, over the damson-trees in the orchard yonder, you may see a stack of queer-like stone chimneys. Them is the Hope Farm chimneys. It's an old place, though Holman keeps it in good order.' Mr. Holdsworth had risen from the table with more promptitude than I had, and was standing by the window looking. At the landlord's last words he turned round, smiling. "'It is not often that parsons know how to keep land in order, is it?' "'Beg pardon, sir, but I must speak as I find, and Minister Holman—we call the church clergyman here parson, sir—he would be a bit jealous if he heard a dissenter called parson. Minister Holman knows what he's about as well as e'er a farmer in the neighbourhood. He gives up five days a week to his own work, and two to the Lord's, and it is difficult to say which he works hardest at. He spends Saturday and Sunday a-writing sermons and a-visiting his flock at Hornby and at five o'clock on Monday morning he'll be guiding his plough in the Hope Farn yonder, just as well as if he could neither read nor write. But your dinner will be getting cold, gentlemen." So we went back to the table. After a while Mr. Holdsworth broke the silence. "'If I were you, Manning, 
I'd look up these relations of yours. You can go and see what they're like while we're waiting for Dobson's estimates, and I'll smoke a cigar in the garden meantime." "'Thank you, sir. But I don't know them, and I don't think I want to know them." "'What did you ask all those questions for, then?' said he, looking quickly up at me. He had no notion of doing or saying things without a purpose. I did not answer, so he continued. "'Make up your mind, and go off and see what this farmer minister is like, and come back and tell me. I should like to hear.' I was so in the habit of yielding to his authority or influence that I never thought of resisting, but went on my errand, though I remember feeling as if I would rather have had my head cut off. The landlord, who had evidently taken an interest in the event of our discussion in a way that country landlords have, accompanied me to the house door, and gave me repeated directions, as if I was likely to miss my way in two hundred yards. But I listened to him, for I was glad of the delay to screw up my courage for the effort of facing unknown people and introducing myself. I went along the lane, I recollect, switching at all the taller roadside weeds, till, after a turn or two, I found myself close in front of the Hope Farm. There was a garden between the house and the shady, grassy lane. I afterwards found that this garden was called the Court, perhaps because there was a low wall round it, with an iron railing up the top of the wall and two great gates between pillars crowned with stone balls for a state entrance to the flagged path leading up to the front door. It was not the habit of the place to go in either by these great gates or by the front door. The gates, indeed, were locked, as I found, though the door stood wide open. I had to go round by a side path lightly worn on a broad grassy way, which led past the court wall, past a horse mount, half covered with stone crop and little wild yellow fumitory, to another door, the curate, as I found it was termed by the master of the house, while the front door, handsome and all for show, was termed the rector. I knocked with my hand upon the curate door. A tall girl, about my own age, as I thought, came and opened it, and stood there silent, waiting to know my errand. I see her now, cousin Phyllis. The westering sun shone full upon her, and made a slanting stream of light into the room within. She was dressed in a dark blue cotton of some kind, up to her throat, down to her wrists, with a little frill of the same wherever it touched her white skin. And such a white skin as it was! I have never seen the like. She had light hair, nearer yellow than any other colour. She looked me steadily in the face with large, quiet eyes wondering but untroubled by the sight of a stranger. I thought it odd that so old, so full-grown as she was, should wear a pinafore over her gown. Before I had quite made up my mind what to say in reply to her mute inquiry of what I wanted there, a woman's voice called out, "'Who is it, Phyllis? If it is any one for buttermilk, send them round to the back door.' I thought I could rather speak to the owner of that voice than to the girl before me, so I passed her, and stood at the entrance of the room hat in hand, for this side door opened straight into the hall or house-place where the family sat when work was done. There was a brisk little woman of forty or so, ironing some huge muslin cravats under the light of a long vine-shaded casement window. She looked at me distrustfully till I began to speak. "'My name is Paul Manning,' said I, but I saw she did not know the name. "'My mother's name was Moneypenny.' said I. Margaret Moneypenny. "'And she married one John Manning of Birmingham,' said Mrs. Holman eagerly. "'And you'll be her son. Sit down. I am right glad to see you. Think of your being Margaret's son. Why, she was almost a child not so long ago. Well, to be sure, it is five and twenty years ago. And what brings you into these parts?' She sat down herself, as if oppressed by her curiosity as to all the five-and-twenty years that had passed by since she had seen my mother. Her daughter Phyllis took up her knitting, a long grey worsted man's stocking, I remember, and knitted away without looking at her work. I felt that the steady gaze of those deep grey eyes was upon me, though once, when I stealthily raised mine to hers, she was examining something on the wall above my head. When I had answered all my cousin Holman's questions, she heaved a long breath, and said, "'To think of Margaret Moneypenny's boy being in our house! I wish the minister was here. Phyllis, in what field is thy father to-day?' 
In the five-acre. They are beginning to cut the corn. He'll not like being sent for, then, else I should have liked you to have seen the minister. But the five-acre is a good step off. You shall have a glass of wine and a bit of cake before you stir from this house, though. You're bound to go, you say, or else the minister comes in mostly when the men have their four o'clock. I must go. I ought to have been off before now. Here, then, Phyllis, take the keys. She gave her daughter some whispered directions, and Phyllis left the room. "'She is my cousin, is she not?' I asked. I knew she was, but somehow I wanted to talk of her, and did not know how to begin. "'Yes, Phyllis Holman. She is our only child. Now—' Either from that now, or from a strange momentary wistfulness in her eyes, I knew that there had been more children, who were now dead. "'How old is cousin Phyllis?' said I, scarcely venturing on the new name. It seemed too prettily familiar for me to call her by it. But cousin Holman took no notice of it, answering straight to the purpose. Seventeen last May Day! But the minister does not like to hear me calling it May Day,' said she, checking herself with a little awe. "'Phyllis was seventeen on the first day of May last,' she repeated, in an amended edition. "'And I am nineteen in another month,' thought I to myself. I don't know why. Then Phyllis came in, carrying a tray with wine and cake upon it. "'We keep a house-servant,' said Cousin Holman. "'But it is churning day, and she is busy.' It was meant as a little proud apology for her daughter's being the handmaiden. "'I like doing it, mother,' said Phyllis, in her grave, full voice. I felt as if I was somebody in the Old Testament, who, I could not recollect, being served and waited upon by the daughter of the host. Was I like Abraham's servant, when Rebecca gave him to drink at the well? I thought Isaac had not gone the pleasantest way to work in winning him a wife. But Phyllis never thought about such things. She was a stately, gracious young woman, in the dress and with the simplicity of a child. As I had been taught, I drank to the health of my new-found cousin and her husband, and then I ventured to name my cousin Phyllis, with a little bow of my head towards her. But I was too awkward to look and see how she took my compliment. "'I must go now,' said I, rising. Neither of the women had thought of sharing in the wine. Cousin Holman had broken a bit of cake for form's sake. "'I wish the minister had been within,' said his wife, rising too. Secretly I was very glad he was not. I did not take kindly to ministers in those days, and I thought he must be a particular kind of man, by his objecting to the term May Day. But, before I went, cousin Holman made me promise that I would come back on the Saturday following and spend Sunday with them, when I should see something of the minister. "'Come on Friday, if you can,' were her last words as she stood at the curate door, shading her eyes from the sinking sun with her hand. Inside the house sat cousin Phyllis, her golden hair, her dazzling complexion, lighting up the corner of the vine-shadowed room. She had not risen when I bade her good-bye. She had looked at me straight as she said her tranquil words of farewell. I found Mr. Holdsworth down at the line, hard at work superintending. As soon as he had a pause, he said, "'Well, Manning, what are the new cousins like? How do preaching and farming seem to get on together? If the minister turns out to be practical as well as reverend, I shall begin to respect him.' But he hardly attended to my answer. He was so much more occupied with directing his work-people. Indeed, my answer did not come very readily, and the most distinct part of it was the mention of the invitation that had been given me. "'Oh, of course you can go. And on Friday, too, if you like. There is no reason why not this week. And you've done a long spell of work this time, old fellow.' I thought that I did not want to go on Friday, but when the day came I found that I should prefer going to staying away so I availed myself of Mr. Holdsworth's permission, and went over to Hope Farm some time in the afternoon, a little later than my last visit. End of section 1